Good afternoon. We had earlier planned to streamline safe management measures to make them simpler and easier to calibrate as we transit to COVID resilience. But we decided to postpone the implementation in view of the load on hospital capacity due to the surge in daily cases. While the number of severe cases remains stable, the high number of uh, daily admissions did pose a strain on the overall healthcare resources and manpower. As Minister Ong shared two days ago, the Omicron wave has likely peaked and is starting to subside. We will now proceed with our plan, streamlining of the SMM. We are keeping the key safe management measures like mask wearing and group sizes for social gathering and dining. So this is not a relaxation, but a streamlining. The streamlining of the SMM is important as it will be easier for businesses and individuals to understand and comply with and also encourage a greater sense of a personal individual responsibility. To recap, we will streamline the SMMs based on five key parameters, group sizes, mask wearing, workplace requirements, safe distancing, and capacity limits. Minister Lawrence Wong will elaborate on these adjustments. From 15 March, we will also rationalize the safe management measures for migrant workers living in dormitories, usage of sports facilities, Group sizes and events in dormitories and recreation centres will be aligned with the general community SMMs. In addition, Ministry of Manpower will also expand the community visit programme so that more vaccinated migrant workers can visit the community. We will further simplify our border measures from 14 March 2359, or effectively 15 March, Instead of a supervised self-swap ART, the vaccinated travel lane travellers and travellers from the Cat 1 countries regions will just need to take an unsupervised self-swap ART within, 48, uh, within 24 hours of their arrival. They will still need to report their test results and they will also still need to take a pre-departure test. We welcome Malaysia's announcement to reopen its borders on 1st April and we are working out the detailed operational arrangements with them and will share more details when we are ready. While there is no need to rush to apply, those with a greater need to travel such as for employment may want to update the necessary travel documents such as your vehicle entry permits or your passports. I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for your patience and for your support. In particular, I want to thank our healthcare workers and frontline workers for your dedication and hard work throughout this pandemic. Singapore is committed to living with COVID-19 and we will get there in a safe and calibrated manner. We will continue to monitor the situation closely and when the situation improves and healthcare capacity permits, we will be able to take the next step in easing our SMMs. Even as we gradually resume our economic and social activities, I would like to remind everyone to continue to observe the SMMs and exercise personal responsibility. Let us continue to work together as we transit to a COVID-resilient nation. Thank you. And now I pass on to uh, uh, Minister uh, Ong Yikang to give an update on the healthcare side. Thank you, Kim Yong, for the summary. Let me give a brief update of the epidemic situation. Um, as everyone knows, we are going through an Omicron wave. Ours is largely driven by the BA2 variant, which accounts for about 90% of daily cases today. Um, there are good indications that the wave has peaked and is subsiding, albeit slowly. Um, based on, we monitor the seven-day moving average of local cases and on the 26th of February, that's when the number peaked at about 18,300 cases. Yeah, seven-day moving average. And since that day, case numbers has come down steadily and gradually, and it stands about 16,300 or so, uh, as of yesterday. 
The week-on-week -week ratio is now 0 0.93. What it means is that if it stays at 0 0.93 in four to five weeks, the number will half. But we expect week-on-week -week ratio to reduce further in the coming days. Reproduction rate is about 1.0 now. So we hope this reduction in daily caseload will accelerate in the coming days. Um, the NTF has explained, and I'm glad today there's a widespread acceptance by our population that what is important is not so much the daily caseload, but how that daily caseload translates into hospitalization and illness severity, and then impact our healthcare system. Um, as of now, public hospital, polyclinics, GP clinics have been and are still very busy and healthcare workers have been coming under significant stress. Fortunately, the ICU utilization rate are well within capacity and so too are infected patients who need oxygen supplementation. However, normal wards, especially the emergency departments, they are overloaded. In tandem with the drop in cases over the past a uh, couple of weeks, the number of e emergency department attendants has come down somewhat over the same time period. It used to be 3,000 cases a day attended to by our public hospitals and that has dropped to 2,800 cases a day. Some drop, but it is still a very high number. To support the hospitals, MOH has stepped up various efforts. One is to beef up manpower for public health institutions. And this, we have tremendous help from the SAF, and we thank them very much. They have supplied us with very skilled medics as well as their supervisors. We have also recalled nursing students who are doing their advanced diplomas, about 300 of them, and thank them for returning back to work and, and staying the post and, and contributing to the public hospitals. Um, we are transferring more patients from public hospitals to other care settings. One major care setting are the private hospitals. Um, we got the private hospitals to raise the risk profile of the kind of patients they can take in, and as a result, they have been increasing the number of patients they can take in from the public hospital. So we can now transfer more patients from public hospitals to private hospitals, which is a big help. We also were in, we have been increasing the number of transfers from public hospitals to our CTFs, the COVID-19 treatment facilities. Let me explain this a bit. We used to have many CTF bits, um, more than 4,000 of them, but they were not well utilized, only 10 to 20% occupied. So we worked with the CTFs who are operated by private healthcare providers to repurpose the facilities consolidated their manpower so that we improve the nurse to patient ratio and so that they are also able to handle higher risk patients now. And this allowed more patients in public hospitals to be transferred to the CTFs. So now the CTFs are very are 50 to 60% occupied now. Where possible, hospitals will also provide home care instead of hospital care and give the family support so that a patient can recover at home. We also partner, partnered various stakeholders to reduce emergency department admissions, such as SDF, SCDF may now bring clinically stable patients directly to CTF rather than to public hospital and then decan to CTFs. We are also, um, from this week onwards, uh, from the start of this week, we have been diverting some non-COVID cases from private hospitals and care facilities, or rather, let me repeat that. We are starting to divert some non-COVID cases from public hospitals to facilities outside of the public hospitals, such as private hospitals and the CDS. So these are non-COVID but stable patients who require monitoring and management of their chronic conditions. And we set up sp specific facilities such as an entire hall at Connect and Changi, where these patients can be recited. And that will free up capacity and reduce the load in public hospitals as well.
So because of all these efforts, we have managed to transfer on average 470 patients per day out of public hospital wards and their EDs every day. COVID-19 cases in hospitals have fallen from the peak of about 1,700 to 1,450 now, but as I say, it's still a high number. And we'll continue these efforts to relieve the public hospitals, especially their emergency departments. And we can all do our part to help ease the workload on hospitals and the pressure on healthcare workers. So how do we do our part? It means if we are experiencing, if we are infected and then experiencing mild symptoms, do not visit the hospital emergency departments. Instead, go to a GP clinic, or if you really need some kind of documentation proof, go to a test center where you can be tested and be given such a document, and then recover at home. The great majority of Singaporeans, we have done our part to get ourselves vaccinated, and it made such a huge difference to our pandemic management and relief really relieve the workload on our public hospitals. Now we can continue to do our part by avoiding going to emergency departments of our hospitals when it is not necessary. I thank healthcare workers for your continued dedication and hard work remaining at your post despite the very heavy workload. I also want to thank our partners, private hospitals and those who run our CTFs and also our GPs, our primary care partners, for all your support and taking on all this workload. Given the above and the situation in our healthcare sector, it is not time to ease our safe management measures. However, we can proceed with SMM125, which we announced three weeks ago and which we have been deferring, because these are largely streamlining in nature. I thank the public for your understanding for these three weeks as we defer those measures, but it is important for us to stand in solidarity with our healthcare workers. As the MTF has explained earlier, three weeks ago, SMM 1 to 5, they are largely streamlining measures. The key parameters and factors that will drive infections, such as group sizes, wearing of masks, no change to them. These are important to continue to keep check on the transmissions. But even if there are some rules where they are streamlined away and some marginal impact on infections, transmission, these will typically be felt two weeks later, when cases would have fallen even further and more than offset any impact. On the other hand, by moving to SMM 1 to 5, the rules are, will be simpler to understand, to remember, and people are more likely to be able to do their part, exercise personal responsibility to help us manage the pandemic. Part of the streamlining measures include some easing, and I think the most critical is that we will allow sports activities to resume. And this is a significant move because on the risk side, as contact during sports activities are transient, there has been no clear evidence that sporting activities drive infections. On the benefit side, sporting activities bring tremendous benefits, especially to our young, physically and emotionally. After two years of suspending sporting activities, I think that suspension is taking its toll, especially amongst our young. So in the coming weeks, MCCY will bring back sporting activities progressively, starting with selected operator-supervised facilities. So SMM 1 to 5, resumption of sports, these are all essential steps to prepare us to live with COVID-19 and enable us to progressively ease our SMMs when the conditions further improved in time to come. And SMM 1 to 5 will be effective from next Tuesday, 15 March 2022. Um, one last aspect is that as we manage the pandemic, another important consideration is the condition of patients coming to our hospitals seeking inpatient care. 
Increasingly, our hospitals are observing they are reporting sick, not so much because of COVID-19, but because of their chronic illnesses. So they are admitted with COVID-19 and not necessarily because of COVID-19. And these patients typically, they have quite significant chronic conditions, underlying conditions, and COVID-19 infections tip them over to becoming quite sick or very sick. Um, so I, for these patients, the primary aggravating factor is their chronic illness and not so much the transmission wave. Let me now invite DMS to explain this further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Our weekly case numbers uh, have been coming down over the last two weeks. As of the 9th of March, uh, of the over 60,000 cases uh, presently uh, in, the, uh, in Singapore with active infections, about 92% of these cases are recovering at home, either under the home recovery program or under our primary care directed protocol two. 2.6% of cases admitted uh, uh, into the acute hospitals while the remaining 5.4% uh, recovered in community care facilities. Our COVID-19 related emergency department attendances remain high, but has come steadily down from an average of about 1,700 to about 1,500 in the last two weeks. The numbers of COVID-19 infected persons presenting to hospital emergency departments may have come down due to a variety of factors including the slow but steady decline in community cases, but also because members of the public have been heeding MOH's advice to visit quick testing centres if they are clinically well, or GPs if they have mild symptoms and suspect that they have COVID-19 infection, but do not require an emergency department consultation. Our hospital emergency departments remain very busy. They continue to see about 2,800 cases per day, which is a decrease from about 3,000 cases per day in the last two weeks. And as Minister has shared, this is still a high number. In some of our hospitals like uh, KK Hospital, we've started to see an increase in admissions for children with respiratory conditions other than COVID-19. And this may well be reflective of an increase in community activities that take place with an increased risk of spread of other respiratory infections other than just COVID-19. Not all patients are admitted for COVID-19 infection. And of every 100 patients who are admitted into hospital, 25% are diagnosed to have COVID-19 at the time of their admission. This 25% is contributed by 20% who are admitted for other medical conditions and where COVID-19 was only an incidental diagnosis. Some of them may well have had chronic medical conditions, but COVID-19 tipped them over and made their chronic conditions more severe, requiring hospitalization. But the remaining 5% were admissions specifically for the treatment of COVID-19 and related problems. So, three quarters of hospital patients, or 75%, are not COVID-19 infected and are admitted for treatment of acute medical emergencies or chronic medical conditions that are now uncontrolled. If we factor in the cases who are primarily admitted for these poor, uh, poorly controlled chronic medical conditions, but potentially tipped over by COVID-19, or who have complications related to these conditions, or for acute medical emergencies, and diagnosed incidentally to have COVID-19, then the overall proportion of patients hospitalized primarily for non-COVID related uh, treatments can come up to as much as 90-95%. So with the decrease in community cases over time, I expect that we may see a drop in the number of cases that will eventually get admitted to hospital, but that number may vary anything between 5 and 25% uh, over the next two to four weeks, depending on uh, how much of uh, patients with chronic medical conditions continue to get admitted into hospital. The majority of these patients drive the high workload in our hospitals presently. And while we expect some burden on our hospitals to ease with fewer COVID cases coming in for admission and treatment, the hospitals will remain busy for quite some time due to this ongoing demand. And as I mentioned, we expect that this demand will continue for the next two to four weeks. Our SMMs 
now refreshed and reframed, remain unlikely to change the situation in our hospitals at this time. And if we still maintain our discipline of adhering to these revised SMMs, and if we self-isolate when we are infected, then this drop in community cases we currently see can be sustained and it will eventually drive a decrease in our hospital admission rates as well. These cases of non-COVID-related admissions reflects a debt that we had incurred over the last few months for patients with non-COVID-related conditions which must now be repaid as the number of COVID cases needing hospitalisation progressively reduces over time. And as our hospitals reprioritize to focus on providing care for non-COVID patients. The percentage of COVID-19 cases that have been admitted in our public hospitals has decreased from about 1.6% over the last two weeks to 1.3% now. And of all COVID-19 cases reported in the last two weeks, 0.3% eventually needed oxygen supplementation or ICU care or died from their illness. If I focus only on the cases that were admitted into the hospitals, then about 15% of these admitted cases required oxygen supplementation or ICU care. For all intents and purposes, the COVID-19 cases that we treat are all of the Omicron variant lineage, the majority of which are BA2 variant. Our overall experience echoes that in other countries where many people with Omicron infections have mild illness and have made uneventful recoveries. And while the risk of getting a severe infection is much lower with the Omicron variant and with vaccinations being effective in reducing that risk of hospitalization and of having a severe infection, the figures that I have cited demonstrate there are still patients who are very sick with COVID-19 infection who require oxygen supplementation and or ICU care. And I regret that, that we will still see some of these patients eventually succumbing to their illness and passing on over the next few weeks as well. I shared at previous press conferences that our healthcare staff are very busy attending to patients with both COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 related serious medical conditions. We are grateful for the support provided by healthcare professionals from the rest of our healthcare system who have volunteered to augment our staff in the hospitals and community treatment facilities as well as our transitional care facility. The SAF had deployed medical officers and medics, for example, to the emergency departments of some of our hospitals, and this did provide some critical relief in February. Other volunteers have stepped forward, including those with healthcare backgrounds and medical students as well. Fully trained nurses attending their higher studies in the Advanced Diploma in Nursing program have also returned to the hospitals to contribute and support their colleagues and peers. I'm highly appreciative of all the efforts of these healthcare staff and hope they will be able to find time to rest and rejuvenate themselves as our community case numbers ease over the next month. And we can all do our part to support our healthcare workers. It remains important that if we are sick and have mild symptoms with not, without any need for hospital care, we should resist that temptation to seek consultation in hospital emergency departments. We should let our hospitals, doctors and nurses devote their attention on those who are more seriously ill and need their care. And if you have a chronic medical condition that requires regular follow-up with your family, physician or GP, please continue to do so and heed the instructions of your doctor. Keeping your chronic condition under good control will also reduce the need for you to come into the hospital for further care, and that further reduces the burden on our hospitals. Your cooperation in keeping to the recommended protocols has allowed our community treatment facilities and hospitals to focus on those who are more severely infected and at a higher risk of a poorer outcome from COVID-19. And we will continue to provide options for patients to receive the appropriate care in settings outside the acute hospitals, at home, and supported by telehealth providers or in our community treatment facilities. And we will continue our efforts to work with our hospitals so as to reduce the unnecessary stays in hospital, reserving hospital beds for those who truly have a continued need for hospital care. Thank you. Good evening.
Uh, given the assessment of the latest infection situation, as you heard just now, we have decided that we will be able to proceed with the streamlining of our SMMs or SMMs 1 to 5. Uh, let me recap what the SMMs, this streamlining exercise is about, SMM 1 to 5, and also explain uh, why these moves should be seen as a rationalization exercise and not an easing of rules. So, what are these uh, SMMs 1 to 5? First, group size. We will keep group size at 5 persons. And that's, this is extremely important because group size directly affects the number of close contacts that each person has and is a key factor in driving infections. So, we are maintaining at 5 persons for the group size parameter. Uh, we are allowing or simplifying the rules so that you can have five unique visitors per household at any one time instead of five per day. Now, this may be seen as an easing in some sense, but in fact, most households do not receive multiple sets of visitors outside of festive periods. Right? You don't have multiple groups visiting you in any, at any day. Uh, most people don't do that outside of festive periods. And for those who want to meet multiple groups of friends, they probably are already doing so outside of their homes anyway. And that's why when we looked at this and we consulted with the experts, we felt that simplifying this particular rule will not add that much to transmission risk. What's more important is that all of us continue to exercise self-restraint and responsibility. So try, I mean, do, do not, you know, be responsible in, in terms of how many multiple groups of friends you meet, be it at home or outside of the home, especially if you are living with a vulnerable person within your home. And if you're not feeling well, then certainly, Certainly, please do not go out to meet anyone, right? Take precautions, test yourselves. So it, it, in the end, it still comes down to personal responsibility. But that's the first parameter, group size. Second, mask wearing remains a default both indoors and outdoors. And that is uh, still very important because mask wearing continues to confer significant protection against infection. Thirdly, we have the requirement of safe distancing. We are standardizing at one meter for safe distancing. And we say it's no longer a requirement uh, for mask on setting. So if you have a mask on, this is no longer required, although it is encouraged. And this is a recognition that masking remains a key means of protecting against infection. That's why if you have your mask on, then you do not need to have that one meter safe distancing, although it is still encouraged. Fourthly, capacity limits. For events and settings with 1,000 or fewer people, we are going to remove the size limits or the zoning requirements because really, if you're mask on, you know, these additional zoning requirements do not add so much in terms of additional precautions. So we are streamlining and simplifying those. But if you have a large event or setting, over 1,000 persons, then we will uh, implement the safeguards through a capacity limit and we will have it at 50% capacity limit, 50% of the uh, capacity of that particular venue. And it can apply to a cruise, to an attraction, or to a MICE event. And then finally and fifthly, workplace, we are maintaining the current posture which, which is that 50% of the people who can work from home are allowed to return to the office. So that doesn't change. What we are doing is to streamline and align the workplace SMMs with the community SMMs. Because today, if you are at work, in fact, you are not allowed to dine together, to have a lunch break together with your colleague in a group of five. You can only eat on your own under today's rules. But... If you were to go out to a hawker centre, you can sit with five people on a table and have lunch together. So it's inconsistent. And that's what we're trying to get at, to 
simplify, streamline and remove these inconsistencies. So we will align the workplace MMMs with the community SMMs so that there will be less confusion and you can, whether it's in the workplace or outside in the community, you can have a gathering of up to five persons based on the group size rule. So these are SMMs one to five. I hope everyone understands it is an exercise to simplify, to streamline, and to rationalize. We have assessed this very carefully, distilled this to the most important and effective SMMs, and we believe that doing so will not result in additional risk or transmission risk, because this is not meant to be an easing of rules, it's meant to be a streamlining exercise. Where we are easing is where it comes to sports. So there is some easing with regard to sports because we are allowing team sports for up to 30 fully vaccinated persons to proceed as we had announced earlier. So this one, yes, there is some easing. But on this, we had considered it very carefully as Minister Ong had explained. We looked at all the different considerations on, and on balance, we felt that the benefits, the overall health benefits of allowing sports to resume far outweighs the risk of infection, which in fact are low because of the transient contact, uh, tran the, the, the transient nature of contacts when you, when you get engaged in sports itself. And there is, so far, when we look around the world and in Singapore, no clear evidence that such transient contacts while playing sports will lead to at higher infections. And that's why on balance, we felt that we should continue to proceed with sports uh, and MCCY will gradually expand this to more venues in the coming weeks. So the moves that we are making, uh, announcing today, which will take effect on 15th of March, are the SMMs 1 to 5, the streamlining and the resumption of sports. And these moves are important, not just because of the simplification and the streamlining, making it easier to understand, but they are important because they will set the stage for further easing down the road. Uh, now that we are past the peak of infection, uh, we are likely, well, while the healthcare system is still very busy, but we are likely to see some easing of the load and the stress on our healthcare system in the coming weeks. Exactly how, when this will happen, it's still early to say because the system is still very busy now. But as the curve comes down, as the infection rate comes down, we will see some easing of the pressures on our healthcare system. And if this continues, then as we had explained before, we will take further significant steps to ease up. And that means allowing freer international travel and relaxing further our SMMs. And the relaxation of the SMMs will be along these five key parameters, which we explained just now. Group size will go up from five to a larger number. We will decide what that number is. Mask wearing, we can decide whether or not indoor or outdoor, the different settings, whether we should make it a default. Capacity limits, we can go up from 50% to a higher limit. Back to office, we can go up from 50% to a higher percentage. So it's very easy to understand. These are the five key parameters. And the next step, we will be able to take significant moves to ease our domestic SMMs. At the same time, free up international travel. Of course, besides these five key parameters, there are a few other specific settings that we have today for higher risk uh, venues or activities. And these are quite specific. They pertain to live performances and singing, F&B venues, alcohol consumption at 10.30, for example, and no intermingling across tables, and nightlife activities. These are very specific, and these two will be reviewed as part of our broader easing. So we will continue to study these different parameters very closely while keeping a close watch on our healthcare system, and we will provide further updates uh, when we are ready. Thank you. Thank you, Ministers and DMS.
We will now begin with the Q&A segment. Dear members of the media, please remember to use the raise hand function on Zoom if you would like to ask a question. And a reminder to keep to one question only. If you are called upon, you will be prompted to unmute yourself. Please do so accordingly. May we have the first question from Selma from ST. Hello, Ministers, DMS. The streamlining of measures is certainly welcome, but as Minister Wong pointed out, it does not represent the easing uh, of measures. From what was said today, as well as the MTF statement on March the 4th, the main reason for holding back easing of measures is the stretched healthcare system. Could you tell us the key parameters that will make you comfortable to either ease or even totally remove restrictions in the future? Um, hi, Selma. The, I think the, we have all, there's a high level of acceptance, I think, amongst our population that the top line figure is much less important now. And what is important is how that top line translates into severity of illnesses and then in turn impact our hospital capacity and healthcare capacity. So I would say that would be the key thing we need to watch out for as of now. But between choosing, choosing between cases going up and cases going down, of course we prefer cases to be coming down because it is, it is a leading indicator indicating that in time to come, shortly, you should have fewer hospitalization and cases coming to our emergency departments. And as um, um, DMS Kenneth have mentioned, and he has discussed this with our team of doctors in MOH and in the system, they think that as cases continue to come down, um, we should see some easing of load, and we hope more than less, more rather than less, in the coming two to four weeks. So this is something we will watch carefully, and that will determine the pace of easing that Minister Lawrence Wong talked about. Thank you, Minister. We will take the next question from Zhi Peng from Zhao Bao. Hi, good evening, Ministers and DMS. This is Zhi Peng from Zhao Bao. Uh, may we know if there would be a need for annual booster shots and whether we have reached herd immunity already? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, the EC19V is studying uh, very carefully whether we need further booster doses, and we're focusing on several uh, um, uh, aspects. First of all, whether or not the general population will have a need for further boosters uh, at this point in time. Uh, the data uh, is still very nascent. Uh, we are watching the experience with other countries. We're looking at our own local studies, which uh, studies how well the protection from the existing boosters uh, uh, is, uh, whether or not that will wane, and whether that will translate eventually then to uh, increased risk of reinfections and infections arising. At this time, we have not made any recommendations uh, concerning further boosters in this group. Uh, EC19V, our expert committee, is also looking at subpopulations because there are populations who are more vulnerable uh, and who may uh, have a higher need uh, for, for more caution for further augmentation of their protection. Uh, but uh, until they complete their, their discussions and issue recommendations, uh, we uh, await them and we will make uh, uh, announcements accordingly whether or not there is a need for further booster doses for this group of people. Uh, we have also been studying whether or not our children need booster doses. But again, this is uh, still quite early days. Our children below the age of 18 uh, had their vaccinations uh, done and completed much later than the rest of the population. And for the majority of these uh, children, they still have uh, a robust protection from the vaccines. We will continue to monitor them and determine whether there's a need for boosters in the future. So all in, uh, um, we are studying this, but um, we have yet to make a firm decision whether or not uh, to offer further booster doses at this time. But we will uh, make the relevant announcements once a, a decision is made. I think we should also uh, bear in mind that uh, there is also a risk of a new variant emerging. And then with the new variants, we will then have to reassess whether or not uh, an additional booster shots will be uh, needed 
for the new variants that may emerge from time to time. So I think we will need to continue to monitor the situation and watch how the epidemic uh, uh, evolves. Thank you, Minister and DMS. We will take the next question from Sherlyn from CNA. Hi, ministers and DMS. This is Shalyn from CNA. So uh, my question is regarding Singapore's land border with Malaysia. I think earlier on it was mentioned that details are being worked out. Could I ask um, what specific details are being worked out and are there any benchmarks we're looking at um, you know, in order to decide whether cars can cross? And are we looking at 1st April as well for that to happen? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the details are being worked out, so we will share more details when they are ready. But I can uh, uh, share that, that we will be looking at uh, cars, motorcycles and additional buses, including uh, private uh, coaches that, uh, that would uh, maybe um, engage by companies for their workers to go through and fro. So I think uh, we are looking at uh, various aspects. And this will also involve significant um, adjustment and fine-tuning of the operations on the ground. Bearing in mind that today we have a few thousand a day and in time to come we may have a significant number of people crossing uh, on a daily basis. So therefore it is a major undertaking. Uh, our land authority, our immigration department are in the, the, uh, close discussion with our counterparts and also working out the operational details to ensure that when we are able to allow uh, more traffic to cross, uh, it can be done so uh, smoothly and safely. If I may just add, there are several aspects to this issue. One is what Min Gan mentioned, which is the whole operations. There's a lot of things to sort out. But second is also, in fact, preceding that will be the timing. And here the two Ministry of Health are in constant touch. And I think we need to time it uh, right when both sides, uh, it must be done when the pandemic situation on both sides allow it. And so this is something also we... We don't think we can predetermine a date, but this is something we're watching closely. And when conditions allow, then we can talk about reopening. Then all the operation issues that Ningan mentioned will come into play. Thank you, Ministers. We will take the next question from Faris from Bloomberg. Hi, Ministers. Faris from Bloomberg. Uh, just one question. Uh, it was mentioned in the statement that, that you, you are preparing for a new vaccinated travel concept in the coming weeks. Maybe if you can elaborate more on that, what exactly is this concept and how it will look like? Thank you. We had mentioned this before, that eventually we would like to introduce uh, the concept of a vaccinated traveller rather than having different VTLs with different countries, categorize countries by risk levels, simplify, free up travel, and allow travel to pre resume so long as a person is a vaccinated travel traveler, regardless of where that person comes from, except for a very small group of countries which we uh, may, you know, be, maybe because there are variants of concern, then we will have to restrict travel from that particular group. But otherwise, for the rest of the world, potentially allow for travel so long as the person is vaccinated and then there are uh, appropriate tests that are done. So that's the broad concept. And as I mentioned just now, as and when we are ready, uh, we will look at easing up further and that would apply both for travel along the lines I described as well as for our domestic SMMs. Thank you, Minister. We will take the next question from polling from Channel 8. Hi, Ministers and DMS, polling from Channel 8 News here. Before I ask my question, can we kindly request for Chinese soundbite on two parts? One is uh, why now is not the time to ease but streamline the measures? And the other one would be earlier, uh, Minister Wong actually said uh, about what we are considering next, the next step of the actual easing up. Okay, then my actual question uh, would be uh, so moving forward, uh, just now actually uh, DMS Mark mentioned about the chronic illness part that actually a lot of the patients currently are admitted because of chronic illness and not because of COVID. What is the significance of this actually to bring it up at this time? 
Maybe Kenneth, you do first. Yes, I will. Uh, thank you very much for the question, Roling. Uh, concerning those with chronic diseases, the reason why we brought this up is also to help uh, our members of public understand that uh, our doctors, nurses in the hospitals are dealing with uh, two distinct groups of people, those who have COVID-19 infection, those who do not. And those who have COVID-19 infection, uh, when they come in, uh, they come in uh, requiring care because they have more severe illness and infections. We hope that as our community numbers come down, those that uh, have COVID-19 infection are admitted, that pool of uh, people will also progressively come down as well. We do know that there may be a lag because it takes time for a person to get admitted and eventually recover from his infection before he's discharged. So while our community numbers are starting to trend downwards, the proportion of cases that are admitted into hospital due to COVID-19 infection may take a while before it actually comes down. But the majority of the workload that our doctors and nurses are facing right now is in fact to look after patients with more chronic medical conditions who are coming into the hospital because their condition has deteriorated. It may not be under very good control and they require more care in the hospital setting. Some of these patients may also have had their medical condition gotten worse as a result of COVID-19, even though COVID-19 is not the active uh, uh, problem that led the patient to be admitted in the first place. So in this group of people, uh, the majority may still require care even as our community numbers come down. So we anticipate that our hospitals may still be busy for a fair amount of time before eventually even this group of people eventually will come down in number. So, so we anticipate that while the, 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 the fact that we have passed the peak in our com community numbers, the numbers are coming down is a good sign. We still remain cautious that our hospitals are not out of uh, the woods yet. And, and we want to continue to watch the situation closely. We are hopeful that in over the next two to four weeks, we will continue to see improvement. And we hope to see improvement to the extent that we are confident that we can take the next step in easing of our, our, of our community measures. 放鬆我們措施的時候 会逐渐的下降但是三个星期前 所以我们要一次过大刀阔斧的把它简单化这个是需要做的当这个做完过后
病人人数会减少，那时候我们就可以开始放松。那时候会几时呢？也许两个星期，一个四四个星期，那个要看情况而定。但是到时呢，我就觉得已经是成为一个情况，就变成呃万事俱备，只欠东风。因为我们的所有的措施已经协调好了，只剩下这五个措施可以调整。只要病例一叠，呃，这繁重的这个病人力啊，呃，病人人数减少，我们就可以开始放松，开始呃，开始能够进行更多的活动。Thank you, Minister and DMS. We will take the next question from Sharon from BT. Hi, good evening. Thanks for taking my question. Um, my question is on uh, specific settings outside the five parameters for higher risk activities, such as allowing live music and alcohol being served after 10.30. So would these be during the next step of relaxation? Thank you. Thanks for the question. As I mentioned, these are being considered, uh, but whether or not it's in the next step or in the subsequent steps, we'll have to uh, make a judgment and it's too early to say for now. So what I have described is five SMMs, the key parameters, each one of them, there will be different stages because the next step we can move from five to another number, but it will not be the final ending point. We may go further beyond that. And likewise for mass, for capacity limits, for the back-to-office parameter, right? You can imagine going from 50% to a higher number before you reach 100%, for example. So there will be a few steps. And exactly when along the way do we ease on alcohol consumption rule, live performance singing, and nightlife activities, that's something we are studying very carefully. And as I said, when we are ready, we will provide further details. Thank you, Minister. We will take the final question from Lee Wen from Asahi. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, in the press release, uh, Minister Wong has said that the migrant uh, workers has become very resilient towards COVID-19 infection. So why are they not still not allowed to move uh, freely yet? Thank you. Actually, uh, I mentioned earlier on in my opening remarks that in fact we are allowing more of them to come back into the community to allow more interactions. But again, uh, um, uh, that is also part of the relaxation, <clears throat> as you would appreciate. And at the same time, we are also aligning uh, the SMM within the dormitory, which used to be a lot tighter, and now we are aligning them with the same uh, requirements, the same rules as the general community SMM rules. So this is uh, basically an alignment and at the same time we will continue to monitor and watch the situation and uh, in going forward I think the adjustment between the dormitory uh, and the community are going to be in sync. We will try to as much as possible to move together and uh, the simplification to uh, five parameters which um, uh, Minister Ong mentioned will allow us to do that. So we don't have to then have a different set of rules for different settings. We just have to adjust the five key parameters. I think this will keep it simpler. And for whether it's dormitory operator, whether it's uh, workplaces, you'll find it easier to understand, easier to implement. And as, as a result, actually, it will be more effective in controlling and managing the uh, pandemic. 